the word of God from the 36th Psalm. For the choir director of David, the Lord's servant, an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked person, dread of God has no effect on him. For with his flattering opinion of himself, he does not discover and hate his iniquity. The words from his mouth are malicious and deceptive. He has stopped acting wisely and doing good. Even on his bed, he makes malicious plans. He sets himself on a path that is not good, and he does not reject evil. Lord, your faithful love reaches to heaven, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your judgments like the deepest sea. Lord, you preserve people and animals. How priceless your faithful love is, God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They are filled from the abundance of your house. You let them drink from your refreshing stream, for the wellspring of life is with you. By means of your light, we see light. Spread your faithful love over those who know you and your righteousness over the upright in heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant come near me or the hand of the wicked drive me away. There, the evildoers have fallen. They have been thrown down and cannot rise. The word of God for the people of God. And the psalm that Matt, uh, Max just read for us on page 490 of the Bible underneath the seat in front of you as we continue our series, uh, Summer in the Psalms. And we are now finally back into some regular order in the Psalms. I think Psalm 31 to Psalm 35, we were kind of moving around and uh, at different points in the last few weeks, not always in order, but we are back in order this week. Now, I don't think this is a new confession if you've been around Sojourn for a while, but as they say, confession is good for the soul, so here we go. I am afraid of the dark, still. I've been afraid of the dark for as long as I can remember. I slept with a nightlight on in my room far past when most kids had turned theirs off. Now, on our honeymoon, we had this great idea to go visit Tucky Leachy Caverns in towns in Tennessee, and it was a great experience until they told us that part of the tour involved turning out the lights. I barely had a moment to prepare before I was immersed in an inky blackness that I cannot begin to describe to you. It was so dark that it didn't matter if my eyes were opened or closed. It was all the same. There was no physical recognition that there was a change in state. I could wave my hand millimeters in front of my face, and I didn't know it was there unless it brushed my nose. It was so disorienting. And I knew that there were people around me. I even had my bride beside me but that didn't stop the surging panic welling up within me. The darkness was intensely disorienting. disorienting. But soon, the lights were back on, and everything was great. I could once again see, and the disorientation was removed. Everything was reoriented. Now, Psalm 36 turns on the hinge of verse 9. By means of your light, we see light. And in this way, the psalm orients us in the midst of our own personal moral darkness and in the midst of broader cultural decay. So we're going to take this psalm in the three stanzas in which it's presented to us and we're going to take it in three stages. And those three, three stages hopefully will be easy to remember. Night, light, and bright. Night, light, and bright. If you're not yet a Christian, or if you're exploring Christianity, let me invite you in the next few moments to ask the question, what resonates with you and your experience from this psalm? And if you are a follower of Jesus, 
My prayer is this, that this psalm would stabilize your heart with a reminder that the Christian faith is not regressive in any way, but it's a story of genuine progress from night to light to bright. So here we go. Stage number one, night, the human condition. The human condition. Verse 36 opens, or Psalm 36 opens with what frankly are disturbing statements for our therapeutic age to wrestle with. When inherent goodness and the light within and following one's truth and heart are popular themes in our culture, these words sound foreign, even harsh. Listen to them again. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked person Dread of God has no effect on him, for with his flattering opinion of himself, he does not discover and hate his iniquity. The words from his mouth are malicious and deceptive. He has stopped acting wisely and doing good. Even on his bed, he makes malicious plans. He sets himself on a path that is not good, and he does not reject evil. These words describe for us what life looks like when it's lived without reference to God. When life is lived apart from him with no regard for his person, his existence, his revelation, or his law. And so the psalm merely agrees with what's been true since God created man. You see, when God's power and his glory, and his worth, and his beauty have no effect upon a person, that person can only be described as verse 1 describes him or her. Wicked. The phrase, dread of God, is the phrase that we read frequently in the poetic books. It's a reference to the fear of God. Proverbs will remind us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so the absence of that fear and reverence and worship of God is the pinnacle of folly. It's the start of a journey towards greater and greater degeneration. You see, God's truth is this. A human is only truly human when he or she has embraced God as supreme sovereign creator And embrace his or her own place as an honored but created image bearer of God. When we move away from these two embraces, we move away from genuine humanity. When a human rejects God as sovereign creator, that human is no longer able to conceive of himself or herself as an honored, created image bearer. And so, that begins a downward descent from genuine humanity to a warped, twisted, dehumanized figure. That journey begins when man doesn't fear God, doesn't revere him for his power and his glory and his beauty. So, man reaps what he sows. Remove God as creator, and you've removed humanity's humanity. But the psalmist continues. Verse 2. With his flattering opinion of himself, he does not discover and hate his iniquity. It's a fact that nature hates a vacuum. And so does the human heart. So when we refuse to stand in awe of God, our self-opinion is naturally going to inflate to fill that void. And so whether we are religious or irreligious, we develop a self-righteous, hypercritical spirit that quickly detects flaws in others, but our self-awareness is sorely lacking. We stop doing the hard internal work of searching out our own sins and weaknesses and failings. 
And this happens, like I said, whether we're religious or irreligious. I sat down this week with a dear friend and brother as he owned the weakness of his own flesh, acknowledging the ways he has sinned against others. I then heard him place himself in the story of what God has been doing in him for at least the last decade. And as I went from that meeting to study this text, I was reminded that friend and brother is a man who fears God. That's a man whose worship of God is so living and active, so real, that he refuses to flatter himself and hold himself in high regard in his own opinion. Rather, he's able to listen without defensiveness in an uncomfortable setting, and he spent a decade eagerly seeking to discover and name and hate the sin that still wants to define him, still wants to shape and form his relationships with others. And through that action, I, it, through that interaction, I was reminded, you will never meet a truly godly person who is not also deeply self-aware. But, when we as individuals refuse to place ourselves under God in the story of reality, well, we've begun to deceive ourselves and our self-deception quickly turns outward towards others. Look at verse 3. The words from his mouth are malicious and deceptive. He has stopped acting wisely and doing good. When we refuse to worship God as supreme, sovereign creator, we will begin to devour others. We will begin to devour each other in the context of a church. We'll dehumanize others. We'll deceive them. We'll turn them into objects for our pleasure or we'll begin exerting power over them. And this trajectory continues unchecked until some outside force intervenes, like we'll say, parental discipline or societal norms or cultural expectations or the justice system. But the progression goes even deeper. It doesn't just go further out. It goes further in. Our mind, our will, our emotions are increasingly bent towards evil. Look at verse 4. Even on his bed, he makes malicious plans. There's the mind bending towards evil. The bed is no longer a platform for a conscience at rest in God to take its rest and ease while the creator works. No, now the bed has become a platform for planning how to work one's own will. How to accomplish one's own way and goals in the world. He goes on, he sets himself on a path that is not good. The New English translation says he's committed to a sinful lifestyle. There's the will bending towards evil. We set our wills to live life without reference to God, and we set ourselves up as our own authority. There's no reasoning at this stage. And we'll use anything to reason away any inhibitions in order that we might move towards what we want, what we desire. And the end of verse 4 says he does not reject evil. There's the heart affections that are bending towards evil. Not rejecting evil speaks speaks of a comfort and an ease with evil. You see, our heart, my heart, naturally bends away from God's revealed will of what is good and bends towards what is evil. Friends, this is night. This is the night of our human condition. And let me be clear, without God and without his gospel, without the means of grace, This, verses 1 through 4, is the natural human trajectory. It's not out of the norm. 
It's the status quo. So can I make that even more clear? Friends, this is my trajectory. This is your trajectory apart from God and his gospel. This is the night of the human condition. There are no other options. It's receive God as creator and our place as his creation or go our own way. Set ourselves up as God. One cannot reject the God of the Bible and then find a way to keep one's humanity. It's impossible. The digression has begun. You know, it's been popular for centuries to talk about free will and to talk about agency and to talk as if at any point we can turn ourselves around. And let me quickly affirm that the Bible affirms human agency. But free will and agency simply affirms this fact. You and I are free to act and make decisions within the confines of our fallen nature. And friends, verses 1 through 4 describes our fallen nature. It describes where our fallen nature leads us, a dark moral night. Not unlike the moral confusion of the world in which we live. And it's not just the psalmist that makes this case in Scripture. Listen to the Apostle Paul. For though they knew God... They did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the creator who's praised forever. Amen. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Here's the darkened affections. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same way also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lusts for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind. There's the darkened mind. So that they do what is not right. There's the darkened will. And while often we would like to leave these verses as if sexual impurity and sexual brokenness is the limit of the wickedness described. Paul continues, they are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness. They're full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, they're slanderers, they're God-haters, they're arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Friends, God gives those who reject him exactly what they want, an existence Without him. And that is a living hell. Now, if the psalm and the story of the Bible ended there, friends, every single one of us is in deep trouble. This is our natural human trajectory. 
So to paraphrase Jack Miller, we are more sinful and broken than we ever could possibly imagine. But that's only half the story. The biblical story generally and the psalm specifically doesn't end there. It moves to another stage. Stage one, night, the human condition. Stage two, light, the divine provision. Now in verse five, the psalmist's attention turns from the natural trajectory of man to the essential nature of God. And now you look down at verses 5 through 10, and what is the main attribute of God that he emphasizes? Go ahead, I'll give you a couple of moments to scan verses 5 through 10, see if you can pull it out. So what is the facet of God's character that the psalmist now emphasizes and draws our attention to? What is it? The steadfast, faithful love of God. He describes it as reaching to the sky. It's mentioned three times in the next six verses. Now, towards whom is this faithful love directed? Well, let's read verses 7 through 9 in the New English translation. translation. It's up on the screen. How precious is your loyal or your faithful, your steadfast love, O God. The human race finds shelter under your wings. They are filled with food from your house, and you allow them to drink from the river of your delicacies, for you are the one who gives and sustains life. So friends, follow this. God gave us everything, including himself, and we rejected him. Since the first man and woman, mankind has chosen to place ourselves at the center of our existence. So God owes us nothing, nothing at all. But what is God's response to us, even in our rebellion? Continued steadfast love. Say, Isaiah, how do you know that? How do we know that God's position, his posture towards rebellious humanity is at base level steadfast love. You know how I know that? Because two weeks ago, my lawn was crispy brown. And today it's green and thriving. Why? Because rain has fallen. Because the sun has shone. Now, I may not want to go mow that grass, but what does my thriving green grass Tell me about God. His faithful love continues. Even in our trajectory away from him. Friends, this is shocking. God's provision for us is unimaginable. God's common grace towards us as his rebellious creations is not what he owes us. It's what he gives us. That's why it's grace. Friends, God's kindness to rebellious humans allows us to eat and drink from his generosity, from the generosity of his nature. The fact that you're breathing right now is exhibit A in evidence that God's steadfast love continues towards his creation. Notice that verse 9 describes the wellspring of life. Now, in our modern world of indoor plumbing and faucets and polluted streams and waterways and water treatment plants, this image, the beauty of this image is lost on us. So let me see if I can help a bit with an illustration. Up until actually the last month or so, Elizabeth and I really enjoyed uh, a tradition when we would drive through Damascus, Virginia. Right before you get to uh, the part in the road where the Appalachian Trail crosses the main road, there is a spring, just a PVC pipe sticking out of the side of a cliff. So we'd grab some clean, empty milk jugs, and on our way to visit her 
grandparents, we would fill up those milk jugs with clean, fresh, pure, delicious spring water. And it was wonderful. The most crisp, cold, clean water you could imagine. We'd get six gallons or so, and then we'd enjoy the next week drinking this delicious water. Well, friends, the wellspring, the source of true, abiding, joyful, satisfying, soul, thirst, quenching life is God and God alone. But we've been suckered into believing that we can only truly experience life by giving into, well, our every sexual whim. Or by embracing the next gadget or gizmo for sale or article of clothing. Or believing that the substances we put into our body, like drugs and alcohol, that those things will provide a truer, deeper, more existential experience of life as it was meant to be. Or we've been suckered into believing that another rung climbed on the ladder or another cross-cultural experience or another vacation. That is what will provide meaning and soul satisfaction. But friends, these are just lies. Pure lies. As one of the prophets wrote to Israel from the mouth of God, my people have committed two evils. They've turned from me the fountain of living water and they've hewn out for themselves dirty cisterns that can hold no water. To believe these lies is to reject the reality that the wellspring, the fountainhead, the source of life is God alone. So that brings us to the hinge, verse 9. By means of your light, we see light. What an interesting phrase. Can we just say it? What, what a confusing phrase. By your light, we see light? Well, friends, this has always been true. But the psalmist could easily have been describing our modern 21st century Western culture. As a society, we... What we see clearly, we see clearly because of God's illumination. And maybe you're wondering, Isaiah, what, what do you mean by that? Well, this. Our modern world has been so shaped by the light of Christianity that Christianity itself is now subject to critique from those outside of it. But what do they use to critique it? They critique it by the very ideals and truths that flow from Christianity. The very realities that Christianity helped to spread as a foundation for Western culture. What are we saying? We're saying, by God's light, we see light. To be clear, as intellectually honest Christians, we can quickly affirm that the church as it presents itself in space and time, is not without the need for critique. Professing Christians have been guilty of terrible things. But let's be honest. Professing Christians can be hypocrites. As in us. But how do we know that this hypocrisy exists? How do we know that those terrible things are in fact actually terrible? By what moral gauge can we judge if not by the gauge of Christianity? If we are nothing more than an accident in an impersonal universe with no pers purposeful beginning and no meaningful ending, then we shouldn't care how anyone acts, including professing Christians. It doesn't matter. But we do care. We care because as humans, we have a purposeful, meaningful beginning 
and a purposeful, meaningful ending. And how do we know that? Because of the story of Christianity. So the light which one needs to critique Christianity and the church, friends, it is not found in secularism. It is found within Christianity and the church. So Christian, take heart. When pressured to conform your biblical convictions to something more culturally palatable, refuse to jettison biblical authority due to cultural pressures and cultural appeals. Cultural appeals, by the way, that are based on an assumed standard of morality. And where is that assumed standard morality coming from? It's coming from the God we worship and serve. It's coming from within the story of Christianity. What, we are, what are we saying in all this? We're saying exactly what the psalmist says, that it's only by the light of God's being and the light of God's personal revelation and creation, his word and his son, that we can accurately assess reality. Divorce yourself from biblical truth and you have no light to assess reality. None whatsoever. This is divine provision. God's steadfast love produces and sustains life, and then it gives us the interpretive lenses we need for reality. And so I think C.S. Lewis was on to something when he said this. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. If stage one is night, the human condition, and stage two is light, the divine provision of life and light, where does that leave us now? Well, we can't presume on God's kindness forever. That spring water that Elizabeth and I enjoyed in Damascus, Virginia, that we took for granted and just assumed at the beginning of July when we went up with eight empty water jugs, that it was going to be there ready for us. Well, guess what? The spring has collapsed. It's disappeared, probably never to return in that same spot. It no longer flows. And friends, the flowing spring of God's common grace provision to all mankind will end at some appointed day. So then what? Well, stage three. Bright. The blessed intervention. You see, we can't leave Psalm 36 in the Old Testament. Because God is still the source of light and life. The New Testament does describe for us the night of the human condition, and it certainly describes the light of God, God's provision, but it goes beyond that, and it describes the bright. When the light and life of God came to earth, the blessed intervention when God clothed himself in human flesh and was born of a virgin, when God the Father sent God the Son to be the Savior of the world. Friends, Jesus is the light of the world who came to reveal to us who God is and came to reverse this human condition. He's the life of God that brings meaning and satisfaction to every soul that will receive him. He's the bread that came down from heaven to provide not merely physical sustenance, but eternal life. Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and he proved it by resurrecting from the dead after he bore the curse of our natural human trajectory upon himself. But why? Well, Jesus came to earth, Yahweh in flesh, embodied divinity, the faithful love of God in personal human form, precisely to rescue the rebels of Psalm 36, 1 through 4. 
to rescue us. To reverse, not just stop or hinder, but to reverse the course of our natural human trajectory away from humanity back to God. He came to be our light by which we see and understand and interpret all other lights. And he came to be our life. So friends, in this way, verse 10 becomes for us, for the follower of Jesus, reality. Look at verse 10. In Christ, God has spread his faithful love over those who know him. Those who recognize his authority and submit to him. And in Christ, he spread his righteousness over the upright in heart. Those who trust in and love the Lord. So church, what joy is ours today in Jesus Christ? We know the life and we know the light of God by name. And his name is Jesus. Church, the fact that Jesus is the bright light and the life of God that we need today that reverses our human condition, this should motivate us from beyond this gathering to enter into a dark world searching for light and life. This should motivate us towards proclaiming the gospel and serving others. This is exactly what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For we are not proclaiming ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So friends, three final questions as we close. First, Have you experienced the light and life of God through Jesus Christ? Have you personally repented of your own dark human trajectory? And have you in turn embraced the death and resurrection of Jesus as your own by faith? And don't answer that question too quickly. In a religious southern city like Chattanooga, it's easy for us to make assumptions. Well, I'm okay. I prayed a prayer. I was baptized. I go to church. So clearly, I must be good. Friend, if your life isn't reflecting Jesus as the light and life of God, then you are seeking light and life in someone or something else. And friends, Psalm 36 is a call to you to repent, to turn around, to seek Christ. Stop the self-deception. Let God's steadfast love cover you today in Christ. And then again tomorrow in Christ. And let his steadfast love cover you again on Tuesday and on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday and Saturday. And then when we come back together, we get to remind ourselves of the steadfast love of Christ that covers us. Friend, that can be your story in Christ. Second question. Christian, to whom this week will you personally carry this good news to outside this gathering? We ought to be overflowing towards those around us with the good news that in our night, God is light and life. And for some persons, maybe some people in this room, but certainly like one couple we financially support, and I will not say their last name because this will be posted online later. But for that couple, that means going to an unreached people group among whom it is illegal to give the gospel. Why are they doing that? Because Jesus is the light and the life. And apart from him, there is no light and there is No life. By the way, that couple is at 90% support and hope to be in their place of service at the beginning of 2025. But friends, God's calling is for each of us to be missionaries. Not just your pastors, not just staff, 
not just the individuals we financially support who are in different parts of our globe spreading the gospel. No, it is our job individually to be on the front edge of mission. You have a sphere of influence that I do not have. You have a relational, you have relational collection connections that no one else in this church has. And we have the privilege of living out and proclaiming Jesus as light and life publicly in our relational spheres right here in Chattanooga. Third question. Christian, will you embrace the means of grace to keep you in the journey from night to light to bright? Friends, we constantly need the means of grace. Communion with God through his word and prayer, the Lord's Supper, the Sunday morning liturgy, these bring us weekly back to the gospel. We need a community in which we're truly known, and we need all of these things in order to push back our very natural human trajectory. And friends, when I say we, I actually mean we, and I mean me. I need these things. So friends, I call us to reject the cultural Christianity that simply shows up on Sunday because, well, that's what's expected. That's what we're supposed to do because we're, I don't know, Christian. No, we need to view our time together in worship as warfare for our souls and for the souls of those around us. We need to view our lives together in community through life groups as essential to our flourishing and well-being and to the flourishing and well-being of those we surround ourselves with. Friends, life groups are a means of bringing the grace of the gospel to bear on us weekly through community with others, others who have embraced Jesus as light and life. And friends, let's commit to doing so until that day when we will enter firmly and finally into the bright of that eternal day when night will be no more. So friends, Psalm 36 reminds us of this. We are more hopeless and helpless than we ever dared imagine. All but in Christ. We are more loved, accepted, and forgiven than we ever dared hope. From night to light to bright, this is the good news of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for Psalm 36 in particular and for your word that reveals to us your character. Father, thank you for bringing light to our dark night, our moral confusion and perverseness in which we would be to this day if you had not intervened in your grace and kindness. Father, I pray for the one or two or five that are seated here and feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, recognizing that they have been living life without reference to you. They have set themselves up as the authority by which to govern life, and they are just now recognizing that Jesus is a more gracious, loving, beautiful, powerful, incredible authority than they could ever dare hope for. Father, would you grant them repentance and faith? And Father, for the many in this room who are followers of Jesus and in these moments we recognize just how weakly we followed him this week. Just how quickly we turned aside to some other false hope, some other means of righteousness, some other source of life and light. Father, we lay those things before you in repentance and we cling once again to Christ alone. And Father, would you give us the grace as a church to be missional. May we not be content to 
simply see people added to this church as they come from this church or that church and simply find a a new home church that feels more like home, but may we be eager and zealous that your gospel would reach the unreached, that it would bring darkened hearts and minds to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, would you give us courage this week to step out in faith and to proclaim that in the darkness of our moral confusion, by your light, we see light. And Father, now as we turn to this joyful celebration of the Lord's Supper, may we receive it with true gratitude in thankfulness, remembering that our standing before you is based upon nothing that we have done, but solely upon the perfection and righteousness and the shed blood of our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.